Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, warm welcome to all of you. Uh, today's uh, for today's public lecture, uh, which is part of our cit cities and history series. But before we start the proceedings, I have a few announcements to make, which are about our ac other activities at Nehru Memorial Museum and Library. Uh, tomorrow we have a workshop uh, entitled Nehru's World. Uh, it's a uh, entire for the entire day. Uh, we have Dr. Chandrasekhar Das Gupta from the Energy Resources Institute, Dr. Pallavi Raghavan, uh, Center for Policy Research, Dr. Raja Mohan from Observer Research Foundation, uh, Mr. Shiv Shankar Menon, uh, National Security Advisor, Government of India, Dr. Srinath Raghavan, Center for Policy Research, and this will be on Nehru's World, which begins at. Oh, sorry. sorry. Sorry, 19th April. Thank you so much. Tomorrow is, as we all know, Good Friday. <laughs> I should have. Uh, so please, I hope that registered. It's 19th. Then on 23rd April, uh, on Wednesday at 3 p.m., there is a public lecture, India in Transition Series, by Professor Chandan Gaura, uh, Azim Premji University, entitled Kannad Activism in Mangaluru, Historical Trends, Contemporary Predicament. Then 24th April, uh, another public lecture in the Cities and History series, Professor Janaki Nair of Jawaharlal Nehru University. The city is history, new Indian urbanisms and the terrain of the law. Uh, then on 25th April 2014, Friday, 3 p.m., we have a seminar by Dr. Stig Toft Madsen from the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies, D Denmark. This is uh, entitled Scaling Up or Remaining Rooter Rooted, the Karnatak Farmers Movement in 1999. <coughs> Besides that, uh, there's another announcement, which is that uh, we also have a publication series entitled Occasional Papers, in which we have published 81 occasional pa papers under the new series called History and Society, Perspectives in Indian Development and Samaj or Itihas. Uh, these uh, papers are available for 100 rupees uh, uh, each. Uh, in the History and Society series, the latest is one by K. Satyanarayan, Politics of Caste and Identity in Contemporary South I India. Then in the Perspectives in Indian Development, we have Anuradha Kalhan, The Possibility of Stimulating Inclusive Growth. We also have a Hindi uh, series entitled Samaj Eva Mitihas, and in this we have a publication entitled uh, by Narin Shukla entitled Bharatiya Swatantrata Andolan or Pratibandit Sahitya Sayukt Prant Ki Vishesh Sandarbh Mein. Uh, these uh, publications are also uh, available on the Nehru Memorial website and they can be uh, downloaded. Uh, with this we now start our lecture for the day. Uh, by Ms. Madhavi Desai. Uh, the, the topic uh, is Women and the City, the Case of Ahmedabad. Uh, Ms. Madhavi Desai is at the Center for Environmental Planning and Technology University, Ahmedabad. We are very fortunate to have her here with us today. Uh, she is uh, uh, a partner in Archie Craft since 18, 1981 and an adjunct faca faculty at Faculty of Architecture of the University, uh, CEPT University, Ahmedabad. She has had research fellowships from the ICSSR, Aga Khan program, uh, MIT, Sarai, Getty Foundation, and she is a founder member of Women's Architects Forum. She is the co-author of Architecture and Independence, A Search for Identity, India, 1880 to 1980. Uh, besides that, Architectural Heritage of Gujarat, Interpretation, Appreciation, Values, published uh, Gandhi Nagar, 2012. Then the Bungalow in 20th Century India, the Cultural Expression of Changing Ways of Life and Aspirations in the Domestic Architecture of Colonial and Post-Colonial Society. She is also the author of Traditional Architecture, House Form of the Islamic Community of the Bohras in Gujarat, published Pune, and the editor of Women and the Built Environment in India, uh, uh, published from New Delhi. Uh, she's, uh, currently, she has a manuscript ready for a book on women in architecture in India, and uh, we really look forward to her talk. Uh, so with that, I ask uh, Ms. Madhavi Desai to uh, begin the lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm very happy to be here. And
and uh, just to give you a little bit of more background about myself, uh, for about 20 years or so, I have been interested and become aware of the feminist theories, mostly as a result of my own experience, you know, when I had small children and I was trying to do practice and it wasn't working out and, you know, slowly I got more interested in, you know, for feminism and then the whole, my, my discipline of architecture and my adapted discipline of architectural history and feminist thinking came together. So as you saw from the publications, I have been, you know, sort of little bit working in this area. Um, and uh, as the cliche goes, the personal became sort of political for me. And, but so far I have been working on uh, sort of uh, domestic architecture and uh, space, mostly because domestic architecture is a kind of a neglected genre in uh, architecture. Um, so this topic of looking at the city is kind of uh, new to me. When I finished that manuscript on women in architecture, um, which formed one part of my interest, which is looking at women as creators of space, uh, I'm now going to focus on women as consumers, but the urban scale is something of a challenge. And when I started looking around for uh, some meaningful work to do, I found that there are hardly any secondary sources in the Indian context. So uh, this topic is, came to me as a challenge, and uh, I must say that when I got the invitation from the, this library, um, I was in a dilemma because I felt comfortable uh, presenting the city of Ahmedabad. But I was not comfortable, you know, should I do this or not? But then I decided to, as they say, bite the bullet. And uh, based on preliminary empirical work, I'm going to, you know, make this presentation. The canvas is vast, therefore. And I, it's more like identifying the issues that one needs to, the focus still has to be developed. But I want to thank the organizers for uh, giving me this opportunity because you know, it made me think, it helped me put my thoughts together and made me brave enough to present it to an audience like you. And I'm hoping that, you know, at the end of the talk, you will be able to give me good criticism, ideas, suggestions. So here we go. There are uh, three parts uh, to my presentation. I'm going to read the introduction and there is a, you know, visual presentation, which is the main part. And then I'm going to read the conclusions. Cities in different parts of the world exhibit different spatial characteristics. They vary in terms of morphological and urban forms, such as neighborhood layouts, density, land use patterns, and building form. Indian cities are multi-layered environments, natural and man-made, historical and modern, public and private create a complex structure of the city deeply influencing its citizens. The built environment constitutes the image of the city and has a high cultural value as a collective memory. There is, however, a gap in the knowledge when examining cities at a more micro scale and attempting to account for the cultural and spatial characteristics at play. With the growing impact of globalization, rapid urbanization, and projects of modernization, Ahmedabad like other Indian cities, has increasingly become less accessible to the marginalized and less mobile populations, such as the elderly, the physically challenged, children, and women being one of them. Urbanization can bring new opportunities, particularly in relation to employment and participation in organized groups. However, it also brings many challenges. While the city can be perceived as a space of freedom, it is also experienced as a site of danger, as we all very well know. Social and political and economical forces and values shape the built environment and its form. Spatial arrangements of buildings reflect and reinforce existing gender, race, and class relations because space is socially constructed and appropriation of space is a political act. At various levels, from the city to the neighborhood and from institutions to the dwelling, the ideals and reality about relationship between men and women is expressed in the built form. The patterns of behavior within private and public spaces are culturally learned and accepted as a way of life. 
Cultural rules that are often internalized govern the use of space and codes regulate behavior between genders. Access to space is fundamentally related to status and power. Men and women experience urban space differently, which helps them reproduce structures of gender and also articulate identities. Though caste, community, class, religion, ethnicity and other variables affect spatial interactions, women form the primary focus of this presentation. Though action research has been undertaken in the West for quite a while now, critical scholarship about gender and the city has remained rather peripheral in India, creating a major lacuna in theory and praxis, severely limiting inputs to design, policy and implementation. The post-independence era became a period of major transition for women as Indian society underwent tremendous economic, technological, sociocultural and political changes. So the first turning point after independence came then. The Indian constitution proudly promised equality between genders to all citizens. The economic transformation after the two world wars and the growing women's movement both in India and abroad on liberal lines paved a path for larger public participation of women. The other turning point came in 1991 with India's economic liberalization and increased level of education. Two major impacts, among others, could be perceived on women. The loosened market regulations enabled rapid economic growth and created one of the world's largest middle classes, employing thousands of young women. The resultant globalization also caused a complex transition period for them as they began to, began to participate in the emerging modern society. In India, the middle class has historically been premised on the confinement of women to the private domestic realm, but now it is different. And middle class femininity and respectability are reconstructed in the public arena. Focusing on these women, this presentation will examine how they engage with the city. A city is a complex entity and it can mean many things to many people. Within the framework of my discipline, that is architecture, I will be looking at the relationship of women to spaces in the city with a particular focus on the public sphere. Women and space. In all cultures, there exists a demarcation between men's territory, that is public, and women's territory, private. Though this has been the predominant theoretical position, there are many gray areas in between. The boundaries between inside and outside are rather porous. They shift and dissolve at times with their meanings modifying in response to the situation, circumstances and context. The definition of public and private varies from culture to culture. However, for most men, the boundaries are very distinct in their minds. For them, the outside is associated with work and earning, while the inside is for pleasure, family and relaxation. On the other hand, Women are judged by the upkeep of their homes, even if they participate and excel in the outer realm. The dichotomy between public and private spaces and restrictions on women differ in each community, being mostly dependent on the self-image, income level of the family and ethnicity of the community. Gender becomes visible in the city in the symbolic coding of spaces through spatial practices and interaction in terms of divisions and exclusions in space, and in the micro geographies of the body. As users, women face direct and indirect restrictions in the built environment in terms of availability and access to space. Though space may be physically accessible to women, it still is not socially or psychologically available to them. With this background, I would like to start the presentation. Uh, and the very first thing I want to do is to uh, quote from Kenneth Gillian's, Kenneth Gillian's book titled Ahmedabad, A Study in Indian Urban History, published in 1964. I quote, Ahmedabad is neither a well-known nor a much-loved city. Since the 17th century, it has been as much neglected by visitors as by writers. Its utilitarian parochial spirit does not attract outsiders. While the Ahmedabadis are too modest and too busy to try to put the rest of the world right about their interesting city. He goes on to say, unlike Bombay, Calcutta, Madras and Kanpur, Ahmedabad was not a creation of the British but a city 
which, while remaining true to itself, successfully adapted to the new industrial age, carrying over commercial and industrial skills and patterns of traditional social organization in a num in number of great cities of India. In no great city of India can the continuity of the past and present be seen as clearly as in Ahmedabad. Perhaps the last sentence does not hold true after 50 years. But I think it's a very good quote which is probably relevant even now. So, um, if we look at Ahmedabad, it is about 600 years old now. And uh, how do I show the... Oh, yeah. I'll have to show that, yeah. This one? Oh, okay. So, within the states of India, uh, the Gujarat uh, coastline is the longest. And therefore, from almost the very beginning, Ahmedabad has been a trading town connected on the sea route through the Gulf of Cambe. And Cambe was a promising uh, town in the uh, early medieval period. And it has also was also connected to the rest of the world almost all the way up to Constantinople by the land route. So I would say that uh, trading and business is in the DNA of the Ahmedabadis. Uh, just one uh, slide to show you basically what the population is. So in the larger metropolitan region, we are about 63 lakhs uh, as per 2011. So in that sense, it's a large city, but we will see how it has grown and because of its form, it still does not feel large. The distances uh, up to a point are manageable. So this one shows you the growth of Ahmedabad. So established in uh, 1411. Uh, and uh, this is the Badra fort which was built by the Bacha. And this is the Juma Mosque, uh, the one of the first uh, uh, more, uh, official buildings that came up. The river Sabarmati on which uh, Badra Fort was located is very central to us as uh, Ahmedabadis. It's very much part of our daily life. And these are the dates where this was when uh, the Mughal uh, rule started, the Marathas, the British and independence and what it is now. Uh, as you can see, the, the, the growth has slowly happened uh, through uh, around the um, central area and uh, slowly it, uh, uh, the fort was here but eventually this became the fort city or we, what we call the inner city when the walls were built uh, in the 15th century, late 15th century it had uh, 13 gates and today, of course, not much of the walls are remaining, but yeah, we can see many of the gates which are there. Um, once the British came uh, and they built the first bridge across and then the suburbs started happening, the railway line came in 1864 and that brought a lot of traffic from Mumbai and it helped in the, the overall industrialization. And of course, afterwards, the growth has been uncontrollable. And uh, we have uh, the municipal limits, which is Ahmedabad Municipal Corporation, and we have AUDA, which is the Urban Development Authority. So, uh, this is uh, the Badra Fort, um, which you can see here. Yeah, it's written here. This is the Padra Fort. And eventually the city grew. Uh, this is the wall which was uh, created, as I said, in the 15th century. Um, this is an enlargement of uh, the fort is somewhere here. And this is the Juma Mosque. And afterwards the Bacha added his tomb and his, the queen's tomb or queens uh, in plural tomb is here. And this is, is the sort of the heart of the city right now, of the inner city. Uh, we will see more visuals of it. What happened was that um, 
uh, Amar Shah invited many nobles and he gave them incentive, he gave them land and they slowly started uh, establishing or having settlements around the fort and there slowly it grew into this kind of a dense uh, settlement. So we have a view of the Juma Masjid, uh, one of uh, my favorite places. It's right in the middle of all the traffic and everything, but if you go there, you forget where you are. It used to have a beautiful uh, kind of a red paving, but I think uh, all religions want to compete with, so they put marble there and it's spoilt from my viewpoint a little bit of the charm, but it is still an excellent example of the Indo-Sultanate architecture, which combines kind of uh, um, Gujarati uh, elements or Hindu elements with Muslim principles. Another um, monument um, built again in the 15th century, this was the kind of the pleasure lake of the uh, Bachas and uh, but it is still the biggest lake in Ahmedabad and uh, uh, as I have said here it was freely available uh, to us and we will see later uh, you know what has happened to it um, but you know I want you to remember this image of um, you know how people used to use it. Uh, there were all kinds of, I can't cover everything, I'm just giving you a few examples, but the, these are the famous step wells of Ahmedabad, again built during the 15th century, um, and mostly they were commissioned at the time of, uh, uh, in, when there was no work, you know, uh, this is how the patronage uh, was carried out so that people, you know, and these beautiful monuments came up, but, you know, people were given employment through this. So if we look at the medieval period, what happened, you know, it was very famous, there was trading going on. But what I would like to stress here was, one is the existence of the guilds, or they were called Mahajans. And uh, they were the, you know, different crafts guilds. They were run by, um, uh, they were headed by Nagar Shet, you know, so Nagar is the city, so they were kind of a mayor. And so at one level, there, were, um, there was, uh, the rulers were Muslims, but the traders and the financiers, financiers were Hindu and Jain. And this is an important point to stress because we can see the continuity of those kinds of families and their effect on the city as, as we go along. And also I would like to stress this fact that the city has always survived on its indigenous social and moral strengths. So we don't have, we had the Mughal rule um, when Akbar uh, took over and we don't have too much of built environment or monuments left. This is the painting of a palace which was built in uh, Shahi Bagh which has now been converted uh, to um, Sardar Vallabhai Patel uh, Museum uh, in the last few years. Um, Ahmedabad went through decline in the 17th century because Surat had come up by then and Kambe was not uh, silting up so that uh, trade uh, sea route had, was uh, going down. The Marathas uh, took over in 1753. The Marathas were not very uh, interested in developing the city or anything. They very often came and, you know, as you know, they looted Surat and went back. So it does not have much, too much of influence, especially left as part of, you know, architecture. The British took over in 1818, which was a, uh, an important landmark in history. So what happened in the British era? The British provided, uh, you know, protection because of the decline in the 17th century. There was a lot of uh, looting and Gunda Raj, etc. was going on. So. And they encouraged commercial activities which uh, revived. The railway line became an important connection. But it's important to note that the first textile mill was established by one of these leading uh, families of Ahmedabad in 1861 when the railway line was not there. And it was uh, established against all odds because the climate was not suitable. But it was just the grit 
and the strong uh, sort of stubbornness of the mill owners that this uh, got established and uh, it eventually um, it became so important we had about 80 mills uh, and it was called the Manchester of India. So the, the textile industry survived till about 1980 and then it declined. But it was an important part, uh, not just the textiles, but also um, the trading of opium and all uh, other trades, fabric, etc., brought a lot of uh, money to the city. So the city, again, fr from the decline came out and it started uh, uh, prospering again. And it brought many other uh, communities also were attracted to the city. Uh, Colonial architecture, though uh, uh, since this is not a colonial city, we don't have uh, predominant uh, examples of colonial architecture like they have in Baroda, where uh, uh, in spite of the Gayakwad Raj, uh, the Gayakwads encouraged uh, architects, invited architects. But So we don't have that, but we have uh, a fair amount of uh, architecture which is uh, colonial, which is remaining especially the bungalows. Um, here I just have two examples, but again they are getting destroyed as, you know, more and more uh, urban development keeps happening. An extremely important time period from Ahmedabad, 1915 to 1930, uh, Gandhi arrived uh, in Ahmedabad in 1915. He established the Kocharab Ashram, in, at that time and then in 1918 he moved to the Sabarmati Ashram and here I'm only talking about the women but of course uh, Gandhi's influence was uh, much for, uh, I don't have to talk about that here I'm sure you are all very uh, much more knowledgeable than I am but what I want to stress is the fact that uh, his presence, his thoughts, his life inspired women of the city not only to come out and take part in, uh, you know, underground movements and wear khadi, etc., but also they became, their lives were changed, and as we will see, uh, they were sort of leaders uh, in uh, many changes that were brought to the society in Ahmedabad. So what happened? So there were, you know, all kinds of changes, uh, and with focus on the women, there was, you know, influence of education, there was influence of Bombay, what was happening. We've always had an influence of Bombay. It's always like the big city for us. And the British, um, when society was just coming out of the feudalism, they started uh, respecting individualism, rationalism, secularism. Uh, there was religious, you know, there was a part of the society which was very progressive politically and socially and... Uh, there were religious reforms also going on. The Pratna Samaj was established in 1871. And several of women, which we will be taking a look at very quickly, uh, they were mostly from the elite families. Um, they were, most of them, almost all of them inspired by Gandhi. And they became leaders in post-independence periods. They had several, they created organizations, institutions especially for the empowerment of the masses. Uh, Ansuya Sarabhai, I have, there are, um, you know, a number of women, I only have listed five or six of them. Ansuya Sarabhai was the sister of Ambalal Sarabhai, was the father of Vikram Sarabhai and all the others. And uh, she rejected her childhood marriage and uh, um, she did a lot, but especially what is to be stressed is that she was the founder of the Majur Mahajan, the Textile Labor Association. And she, it, she was inspired. She, she her, her brother was a mill owner, but she worked with Gandhiji and she worked for the laborers. Indumati Chimanlal Shet, um, again, was a, took a, an important and active role in freedom struggle. And after independence, she became the education minister. She also created, which is also the school where I've studied, Shet C. N. Vidya Laya, and was very an important figure in the society. Vinodini Nilkant, 
writer, essay, social worker in those days. She went and studied, uh, got a master's from Michigan University in the USA. And she was the very, uh, I guess, probably the first person who did not change her last name after marriage in those days. Her mother and her aunt were the first women graduates of Ahmedabad in, or Gujarat in 1901. Rudula Sarabhai, an extremely important political figure for uh, her, for me to, what is to be stressed is how relentlessly she worked with the women refugees in the aftermath of the partition. And she was very important. I, I am not sure, I don't know if there should be books or history books on these women. I don't know if they have been, some of them, some of them they are there. Uh, Lina Mangaldas, a sister of Mrandula, she worked in the field of education. She she's, um, set up the Shreya School, uh, a school where I went to when I was a child. Um, and she, till she died, she died, died just two years ago. And I think maybe about five years ago, she was still going to her uh, education institute and was taking active part in it. Gira Sarabai, uh, younger sister of the other two, uh, is alive, but she refuses to be interviewed by me, and she refuses to be called an architect, but she is a multi-talented personality, and uh, she has done, uh, contributed a lot to the city and to the field of design. An extremely important person, Ila Bhatt, and I know I don't think she needs an introduction, the founder of SEVA, who is still doing still very active and doing a lot of work and she's done so much for the invisible women of Ahmedabad who were unorganized and you know she has given them a new life. And very quickly I'm not going to spend a lot of time on contemporary Ahmedabad but it, things have changed, the society has become cosmopolitan, the industries have changed, it has, the city has grown tremendously. Um, it became uh, sort of the Mecca of modern architecture in the 60s, uh, from the 60s to about the 1980s. Um, and these days it, is, it has acclaimed uh, flyovers and ring roads and everybody talks about its development. And we have urban projects like the BRTS, the bus rapid transit system and the riverfront development. We'll be taking a brief look at that. Uh, as I said, the river has always been very important and the bridges are very much part of our life. The, um, as the city grew, the bridges have increased. Uh, the Ellis Bridge, which was originally built in 1875, which was called the Lakadia Bridge, it was built in wood, but it got washed away. This was the first bridge which connected the old inner city to the western suburb and that is when the, the, the suburb started uh, growing here very slowly. Uh, this is how the bridge looked and now they have added uh, uh, these kind of two bridges on the two sides. There was a talk of destroying this historical bridge and there was a big uproar by the citizens. So. In one of the rare cases, the bridge is saved so far. Uh, I have a few of what we call archival pictures of what the city looked like uh, till the riverfront uh, uh, project came up. So it was very much a part of uh, the peoples. Uh, the river was very much part of the people, especially the working class people. So the Dobi Ghat, as you can see, this is the Raviwari. Uh, which used to be the Shukravari in the Muslim period and it was, uh, it used to happen in the Maidan in near the Juma Masjid but then slowly as the city grew it moved to the eastern bank uh, and this is what, this is where the poor people would go and buy. You can see the extreme range uh, of objects that one could buy but now they have been shifted on the riverfront to some very planned area. And the city did not have, it only had water uh, in the monsoon. So this is what we, where we used to go for circus. You know, this is the circus 
uh, in the river bed itself. And of course we had the slums because, you know, this was the place where they could build free housing. This is all changed now. We have the Savarmati Riverfront Project which has started in 2003 and it's still going on. And you can see what it looks like. It is a contested project and I think it's too soon for anyone to say or for at least for me to say. Uh, in a sense it is saying that it's giving the city to the people but you know one doesn't know what kind of people or who can. So we will see but it is I've gone lot of uh, politicians come from all over India to take a look at it. Uh, these are some, uh, the water, the water has come from the Narmada river, but of course this is uh, only a once in a while kind of situation, we don't have so much of water. But, you know, it is uh, of course being used by the upper middle classes quite well. So coming, we have about three, uh, I think we, we will call these cultural zones. One is the inner city, the wall city which is without the walls but it has its own uh, character. Then we have the eastern part which is characterized by low to middle income housing, historical chawls, manufacturing, a lot of industry is there in the eastern part, civic services and office services. And the majority of the women work from home in cottage industries such as finishing of ready-made clothes, papad, agarbatti making, etc. in the east part. The western part is more affluent and elite, marked by luxurious low-rise uh, and high-rise uh, buildings, major educational institutions, commercial complexes, multiplexes, uh, flyovers, gated communities, what have you. So we are going to take a look at some of these. Uh, the walled city is a core. You can see uh, the kind of uh, fabric that it has. It is very densely packed together. In the wall city, uh, the city is, uh, wall city is made up of different kinds of poles. They are called poles. They are the mahalas. And originally they were, uh, they had come up, uh, this particular uh, kind of a morphological form, form came up because A, because of security, you had to live together. Because of climate, we have a harsh, hot and dry climate, so you didn't want your, uh, all your walls to be exposed. And also because you wanted to live communally in a collective kind of living. So the originally and even today many of the poles uh, belong, you know, to cohesive, well-knit communities. Except that the affluent people have started moving out to the west. So it's no longer uh, that kind of, uh, the social fabric is not so much together. It has been changing uh, over the years. So if we look at uh, the, the dwelling type, the pole dwelling, it generally had a courtyard because at least two of the walls were shared walls. Uh, and many of the spaces uh, were uh, um, multi, uh, had multiple uses. You know, it was no, not really what we would call bedroom and other sort of things. Uh, the, the courtyard kind of formed the the in-between space, the women would be using more of the interior spaces and the kitchen areas, and the front belonged to the men. Uh, the inner city is also very full of different kinds of festivals which happen. So we have the Tajia here, we have the Rath Yatras, and all kinds of informal and other activities. Uh, I studied uh, for another exhibition, I studied uh, some of the cities. So this is uh, some of the city spaces, inner city spaces. The Manek Chalk is very much, we will see in the next slide, it is the heart of the inner city, the main uh, market area. And here what I showed you, the Juma Mosque, the King's Tomb and the Queen's Tomb. And this is the area where, which is known as the Manek Chalk. Here, is the old colonial time uh, vegetable market and these are the very crowded streets. This is the um, one of the Gandhi, it's called Gandhi Road, it's one of the roads that it leads to the station. So looking at, we have the monuments uh, which is part of the Manik Chowk, um, a few plans and uh, an elevation of what uh, the buildings look like. 
originally this could have been uh, uh, upstairs could have been uh, living areas because when the city was set up there was no separate commercial areas you know there were craftsmen who lived there and who worked in the house and women also participated in selling and other things but eventually they have become you know fully commercial areas and this particular space is the uh, jewelry place for gold and silver so you know traditionally it is uh, an important market but of course now things have grown on the east and the west also uh, the it's extremely crowded and uh, the commercial area is dominated by men because we don't have shopkeepers who are women uh, what happens at night for the about last 50 years this manik chowk the the plan that i showed you this is the area which turns itself into uh, an eatery you know so we have the kind of uh, lari walas over there and where i found that the participation of the women was high mostly of course they come with families but i was very uh, you know happy to see a whole group of muslim women who came at night um, so transformation of a commercial space into a food court at night and i feel that these are some of the examples of like a positive space you know which we can learn from uh, good lighting at night is extremely important uh, for women's comfort and safety dalgarwad is another area which is very near the um, manik chowk area which is um, so we see two ends of dalgarwad and it's a pedestrian uh, street there are very few pedestrian streets in uh, in amdavad and here uh, so um, um this is the juma mosque this is the juma mosque and this is the dalgarwad street which is another place i studied and it's a very popular place for middle class women not only from the inner city women from all over andabad uh, come here to buy and uh, they feel extremely comfortable i think because uh, of the fact that it is um, again dominated by by women it is highly used uh, and is also has the human scale etc so again a place which is where you can have intimacy of human space uh, scale and informal atmosphere and rare pedestrian nature of the street it becomes a pedest uh, positive space for women coming to western amdavad uh, again i'm not going to dwell on it too much but these are sort of the images which uh, are commonly found uh, and unfortunately the modern streets uh, have a plan layout and they may have an interesting building as you can see this is a 1980s uh, sort of a landmark it is the revolving restaurant and uh, building which goes with it but i think we fail compared to the inner city where there are still dynamic urban spaces we fail to really create um, interesting public spaces or that we don't put any have not put any effort in it again some more we have lots of malls and uh, these kind of uh, um, shopping areas in the west it's also has many um, educational institutions uh, uh, this is a town hall it's not an education it's a town hall which was built in 1940 it is at the end of the ellis bridge and it talks about the civic consciousness of the city it was been raised recently renovated and then we have the mill owners association um again i'm using this uh, picture to show that he's part of the jain uh, family which you know we talked about earlier and he was the mayor of amdavad and he brought all these important not he but others with him also the elite families brought modern architecture to the city in the 60s 50s 60s up to 70s then what happened when the west side grew so on the western bank we no no longer of course have the organic development or the dense development of what we found in the inner city we have more of a modern uh, grid iron layout and there is no scope to go into the detail but 
what happened to the women who were living over there because they started moving here in the early part people were scared to move out of the the inner city because you know this was a new area it was not very well developed the suburbs were not well developed there were uh, uh, fields which were behind and the people were scared so whole communities started coming out they started developing the middle class started developing uh, cooperative societies and they would build the bungalow because they found that it was a healthier option right or wrong who knows but uh, they wanted to be like the british uh, or to use the british typology and they started moving here uh, from joint families very slowly the transition started happening to uh, nuclear families but not quite yet but i think uh, as the role of women changed and as the built environment changed uh, there was good advantages and disadvantages and in terms of advantages uh, we could see let's in a in a, a bungalow of the 1930s uh, you know compared to the kind of a non descript spaces that the women used to use uh, now there was a bedroom which was given you know this is uh, the hall there are two bedrooms a uh, three bedroom this is the kitchen the uh, that sorry the dining room the kitchen store room and these are the sort of utilities here and the courtyard which was there in the inner cities is no longer here but it becomes a kind of a, a courtyard at the end because the gujarati women still needed courtyard to do all the spices and you know all the housework which is still pretty heavy and then eventually what we have now is you know these low rise and high rise apartment buildings uh, and i am not sure because not much study has been done i am not sure how uh, the individual woman is her role has changed of course uh, these are mostly nuclear families now and uh, there is probably she is part of the working force but not many studies have been done so i don't know but i there is a distinct change definitely in the built environment and i'm sure it is affecting the lifestyle and in the west i studied the himalaya mall which is uh, a very uh, popular and a successful mall many malls are lying vacant in amdavad right now but this one is uh, uh, popular and i was just i don't know this is again one is not sure whether uh, one can call a mall a public space or not i think it can be argued but this is what it looks like it has uh, many shops and it has uh, cinemas and eateries and uh, it is the modern concept of pleasure so it has this huge atrium and uh, i found that uh, you know women felt more comfortable because it was a controlled environment and uh, well lit but still they were coming either in pairs or and here again the 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 internet uh, free internet kiosk was dominated by men and uh, they generally came in groups and i was also little surprised to find the gender segregation uh, as you can see here but i was actually shocked to see the parking area of this beautiful well lit atrium space because there is no concern for the safety of the women here but all in all i found that you know it was an artificially controlled world of fantasy and it was very attractive because the women would come and spend over there so they made sure that their safety and comfort were ensured and uh, you know women uh, do not really you know go too much if you have children then it's always part of you always take the children there is very rarely a middle class woman would go so you know they had various uh, recreational rides etc for women Uh, for the children who came with the women so but the public spaces are becoming more and more controlled and uh, enclosed as we go along the eastern ahmedabad this is not but this is a very typical view it is like the poor cousin of 
Western Ahmedabad. Though I must say that in recent times they have had some flyovers and widening of roads and an occasional mall. But it is very much an industrial space, much neglected. Uh, you can see this is what happens there in the monsoon time. The drainage is all, uh, sewage is mis messed up. There is no, at all, no effort to urban design at all. Uh, this is Hamlata Bhavsar, uh, whom I know and I visited her house. She lives in a small house. This is her kitchen. But you can see the aspirations of the middle class. There is the big TV and there is a fridge and, you know, she lives in this rented house. Um, for pays 5,000 a month. She, has, she says she has worked since she was a teenager. First she went with her, her mother to make uh, agarbatti in a factory and then once she got married, she has been working as a house, uh, um, in a household, helping uh, other women in household work. And then now she has learnt sort of nursing or aya. So she's earning more. But her and her neighbors, all her work is always on the western side. So she lives here, but she commutes uh, to the west side. This is the view of the street that she lives in. You know, her house is sort of here. And this is the view of the outside area. Uh, so you can see the contrast. The only good thing or the very important thing is this Kankaria Lake, which is on the east side, uh, eastern Ahmedabad. And in 2008, this was developed as a recreational space. So we can see it's a very popular place uh, for the people. Uh, again, my personal uh, view is that, you know, we had really nice open urban space accessible to everybody. Now there are tall walls around the Kankaria Lake. Entrance is controlled. You have to buy a ticket. You cannot take your food inside. You have to buy the food from inside. But it's uh, very successful, very popular. Uh, girls come in groups or four or five. Um, also a popular place for family outings and couples in Ahmedabad there is very few places for couples uh, a family kiosk makes a lot of difference I think uh, if you know if we had more women uh, selling things it would make um, big difference in you know whether the other women could approach but that has to be seen. But in all, still, Kankaria Lake is a positive place for women and families. Because of this control, it is clean, there is security, there is good lighting. And it is also an example how good design and good materials, you know, uh, make a difference. Then if we generally look at some other areas, you know, the street as an informal public uh, space, how am I doing on time? Okay. Yeah, I'm almost done. So, um, generally women feel comfortable only in the outside if we are doing something. You know, so, you know, here you can see women, you know, I think I get arguments like, oh, nobody stops women from using the streets. But no, it's how we are viewed, you know, how we are perceived. So, you know, Men, you find them hanging out around tea stalls and uh, anywhere. But women have to be very... Otherwise, you become a public woman. If you just hang out without any purpose, you are immediately perceived as a public woman. So here we have the tea stalls. But again, in a rare case, I found this woman who is running the tea stall, and I was very pleased to see that. Safety issues, I don't think... <clears throat> in Delhi, I have to... I can say anything, but Ahmedabad is hailed as a epitome of modern development and also a claim to be a safe city, uh, just like Mumbai. But just two days ago, I was shocked to find this. State police have said that Gujarat is becoming unsafe. So, you know, there is... Uh, and here again, I have uh, women eating Pani Puri during day, but I have been told that women go and eat Pani Puri at night and... So it is relatively safe, but I think one has to pay. I think it is to have 
sustainable you know there are many other issues which affect safety of women but i think how we design and how we um, look at the built environment is very important uh, for safety issues and you know more work needs to be done i think there is very good work being done in delhi through jagori so i'm hoping to learn from that parks and gardens i'm almost embarrassed to show these slides after driving through delhi this morning with your parks and you know we really have very little space in ahmedabad but you know these are some of the things that i i i found um what i want to stress is you know giving way to anti social elements drinking and drug taking and so if the gardens are not used and not well maintained then it turns into this and it's a vicious circle the women are scared to go there even during day time and then it never gets uh, used so we have some views of parks and gardens um, i must say that the municipality is not doing too badly in this case this is a, a popular garden in the western part which had patronage of a corporate house so the design has been Uh, much better and uh, expensively done and it's well maintained and i studied this sardar bag which is located uh, again across the bridge nehru bridge in the edge of the inner city um it is also as you can see a very large uh, garden unfortunately not very well kept it is heavily used by the inner city uh, population but look at the dismal landscape you know not very well maintained because probably the citizens are not demanding or you know i don't know how the municipality views them it is extremely well used by women and what i was wondering was can it cre can we do a little bit more to really make it uh, you know more uh, usable and comfortable for women i think if we pay attention we can this is an experiment that was done uh, in you know the municipality is not so bad so they were experimenting this was a park which they do, devoted to women from 12 o'clock in the afternoon to 6 pm and it never got used because some of they think that women are free in the afternoon so and it never got used and as this came in the paper that you know it is stinking now it is not maintained the women are walking like this so these kinds of experiments need a lot more look to be looked into now these are two two studies which were done uh, by uh, others which i thought were very interesting and need to be included this is a study done by um, urban management center uh, an ngo in ahmedabad the amdavad municipal corporation had asked them to survey the public toilet facilities and i was very impressed they surveyed 1585 facilities out of 1600 something so um here uh, you can see what kind of facilities exist and i was also very happy that you know there is lot of facilities which is there in the inner city areas till i saw what they looked like and this is you know i'm only showing you five slides out of the whole report but this is a typical case the the doors are broken there is garbage lying so you cannot even approach and this is not a women centered study this is just a study for everybody and then this is the photo taken at night without flash so how do we expect public facilities to be used uh you know at night so definitely no women can go there and here is the ventilation and the kind of dirt which happens here so mostly all of these are sort of uh, lying then also there is it is very clearly said this is for women and you see a man going in and these are some other analysis which uh, has been done so i think the public toilets need a complete rehaul and a lot of looking into if we are looking at the city level public transport is another area i must say that public transport has improved we have the brts uh, uh, which is has won many uh, awards in the world and uh, 
you know, I found that the women were using a combination of these. They prefer to use the, the municipal service because it was cheaper, you know. Okay, I'm hurrying, I'm hurrying. Okay, um, done by a student of mine. She studied the well-being of women and she looked at the BRTS and these are some of the, re the research objectives she had. I don't have time, so I'm going to just let you read this. But she was trying to see how women can be de-stressed a little bit. And who has thought of working women being de-stressed at the city level? So maybe she suggested that, you know, there is a need for toilet. And then she said there should be a small park where they can take a little break. And there should be, you know, eateries and tea stalls. Because they will not go to the tea stalls where the men hang around. So things like that were observed and she came out with a design intervention where uh, if you had the, this is sort of a kiosk that she designed, this BRTS bus stand is somewhere here. And this I just put in as an example that design can make a difference if we work towards it. And this is probably, this is my last slide. Um, we haven't even begun to talk about the invisible women who sustain the city the rag pickers, the road sweepers, street vendors, the unskilled laborers, and the home-based home workers. So just, just a little bit of conclusions. In the 21st century, the focus of the discourses in India has shifted. Okay, so no, I will, I will skip it. I just, it will come up in the okay, it will come up, but only last okay. paragraph is how do we approach this situation? Addressing these issues involves a number of factors ranging from societal change to policy level innovations and government awareness to management strategies. But what can we do as design professionals? We need to change the mindset about women's participation at the planning and governance management levels of the city. We also need to look at micro level interventions, such as proposing smaller neighborhood green spaces, introducing urban childcare centers, adequate amenities like floor meals,